Hello friends, I am greatly honored by the invitation to come and share a few thoughts at this year's AB10 conference, specifically around online theological distance education. I serve at the South African Theological Seminary, an online African seminary, and so that's all that we do. In the African context for the last 12 years, SATS has only done online theological education. So this is our core business and it's a great joy for me to come and share some of the things that we've learned in that time. We're going to have three sessions. Today is about the why question. Why should we embrace online theological education? Then tomorrow, for those who buy the why, tomorrow we're going to talk about how. So how do you start to transition from a traditional kind of theological education to an online one. One of the big challenges in doing that is getting access to the right platforms and technologies to make it viable. This is a real challenge for many seminaries, especially on our continent. But uh, in our third session, I'm going to invite a colleague who has some, some really exciting prospects that may provide a way to solve some of those problems in the future. So that's what lies ahead. Today we're talking about why should we embrace online theological distance education. The media mogul Rupert Murdoch recently said that the world is changing fast. Now that's not a revelation, but the implication for businesses and by extension ministries, he said, is that the big will no longer beat the small. It will be the fast who beat the slow. How fast we're able to adapt, embrace, and change in this rapidly changing world will determine to a great extent how effective we are and even whether we continue to survive, much less thrive. Do you remember uh, this old thing? It's a city map book. When I first moved to Johannesburg in 2004, this is how we got around a foreign city. We navigated with maps. Today, this is completely worthless. We now have somebody on our phone who tells us, turn left in 300 meters, turn right in, etc., etc. So the change in technology made the map book obsolete. Or well, what about these old phone booths? I grew up with these uh, public phones that you used to put coins into and then you could make phone calls. When last did you use one of those? When last did you see somebody use one of those? Yes, of course, cell phone technology has made them obsolete. Here's another thing that's become obsolete. I got saved into a church that used overhead projectors for our praise and worship. And of course, in the education system for a period of time, overhead projectors were a essential technology. They were the, the preferred way in many places of using visual aids. Of course, they're completely defunct today. We use different technologies, and those technologies have made overhead projectors obsolete. Another example that comes to mind is BlackBerry. Did you have one of these devices at any stage? Well, you see, in the early 2000s, BlackBerry was the device of choice. They had these amazing little phones that had a small keyboard at the bottom, and uh, half of the phone was a screen, the top half typically. And at one stage, at least in South Africa, eight out of every 10 people had a BlackBerry. And then in around 2007, Apple came out with a touchscreen phone, the first iPhones. It wasn't long before others came up with similar devices. And uh, within two or three years, Blackberries were obsolete. You hardly saw one. I haven't seen anybody using a BlackBerry for years now. So rapid changes in our world quickly make things that were indispensable obsolete. Something can be indispensable today and almost irrelevant tomorrow. Now for an unwelcome prediction. I think this is the next thing that's going to become somewhat redundant. The traditional seminary will soon be an endangered species. We call shopping centers that are no longer utilized white elephants where I come from. And I think that there's a real danger that our theological seminary campuses 
are going to become white elephants because in the years to come, online theological distance education will become the dominant form of theological education. You might say, well, that may be the case in the West. It's not going to happen in Africa. It's going to happen. It may take a few extra years, but it is going to happen. Now, I know you don't want to hear that, but that's the reality. BlackBerry didn't want to hear about touchscreens. The people who make map books didn't want to hear about GPSs and so on. But the reality is the world's changing fast and it's those who are able to change and adapt who are going to continue to thrive in that changing world. So we're living in a world in which online theological distance education seems set to become the dominant model of the future, at least the foreseeable future. You see, convenience always wins. When people realize that they can do something more affordably and at greater convenience and still have a similar result, then the way they did it before becomes obsolete. The obvious example around us is shopping malls. So in some cities, particularly Western cities, shopping malls are, are having a major impact from the fact that people now buy stuff online and have it delivered. COVID has, has expedited that, at least in our country. But it applies to other spheres of life as well. I play a card game called Contract Bridge. Um, and there's a bridge club. When I first started playing in Johannesburg, there might be as many as 200 people coming out on a Monday evening to play bridge. And then it started to be possible to play online with your friends and your club, etc. And people started to move to playing their bridge online. And there are huge benefits. It used to take me five hours to have an evening of bridge. It now takes two hours. I had to drive an hour each way. I save whatever it costs in petrol and, and, and time by not having to do that. And I can now play contract bridge from the comfort of my own home uh, in a fraction of the time at, at a much greater convenience than used to be the case before. You know what's happened to the club? On a Monday night now, they may have 25 or 30 people. So the shrinking club is evidence of the fact that if you can do something as well with the advantage and convenience of doing it from home, which also saves you money, people are going to vote to do it the more convenient way. What does this mean for theological education? Well, like it or not, one of the implications is that residential theological programs will shrink in years to come. Why will they shrink? They will shrink because we now know that we can do online education as effectively as contact education. The educational results are comparable, but at much more efficient ways. Greater convenience for the student of being able to study from anywhere in the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And as this interplay between convenience and efficiency on the one hand and effectiveness on the other makes it clear that we can achieve the same results for greater convenience, you can predict what's likely to happen. Charles Darwin said, I know he's not our favorite guy to quote, but he, he said with reference to his theory of evolution that it's not the strongest of a species, nor necessarily the most intelligent, but the one most able to change that survives and thrives. While I don't believe in macroevolution, uh, I certainly think that that idea is so applicable to our institutions surviving and thriving in our rapidly changing world. Those of us that are able to adapt and change are the ones that are most likely to thrive. So what I want to do, I've made a bold claim here. My claim is that we should embrace online theological distance education because it is as effective but more efficient than traditional models. It's as effective but more efficient than traditional models. What I want to do for a while now is try to persuade you that that is true. Firstly, we're going to make the case that online theological education if done well, is as effective as traditional contact modes of delivery. And then the easier one to, to accept, I think it's probably self-evident, is that online theological education is also more efficient. So let's begin by talking about the fact that 
online theological distance education is as effective as contact education. It's as effective as contact education. This, of course, is a key point for us because we're in this work because we want to train people for effective service to Jesus Christ. So effectiveness is key. The reality, though, friends, is that the effectiveness of good online education has been proven. The educational effectiveness has been demonstrated beyond a reasonable doubt, and it's not really in dispute anymore. And yet, all too often, and this is sadly very true in the, the seminary world, all too often, like members of the, the hilarious Flat Earth Society, we're unaware of the extent to which its educational effectiveness has been proven. So let's talk about that in two dimensions. Firstly, that it is effective for academic formation. And by that we mean there really is no question around this one. <clears throat> the research is conclusive that when online education is done well, it produces the same cognitive effects, the same growth in understanding that you can accomplish through contact education. And this has been known for a long time, I mean, at least since 2010. In 2010, the U.S. Department of Education uh, published a very well-known report. It collated uh, the research that had been done from 2008 back to 1996, if my memory holds, in which various published pieces of research had reported on comparative effectiveness of online versus traditional education. This had nothing to do with theology to, uh, per se. But one of the key findings of the report was this. Students who took all or part of their class online performed better on average than those taking the same course through traditional face-to-face -face instruction. Students who took all or part of their class online performed better on average than those taking the same course through traditional face-to-face -face instruction. Now this goes back to the period from the late 90s to about 2008 and already then it was evident that when online theological education was done, online education, not necessarily theological, was done well, students learned as much. They performed as well, if not better, in some cases, as those doing similar courses at contact institutions. Those findings have been corroborated by numerous studies since then, with the added nuance that as online education gets better, as technology gets better, uh, the gap is, if anything, widening. In other words, uh, the likelihood that online education is as good, if not in some cases better, is, is more and more the case because technology makes that possible. Now, this is not in question. The literature would pretty much accept that this has been demonstrated to be the case, that online education is as effective for academic formation as contact education. But what about spiritual formation? Well, the bold claim I make here is that online theological distance education is also as effective for spiritual formation as contact education. The traditional objection to online theological education is that it's unfit for purpose. The, the idea is that we're shaping people for a very relational task, leading God's people, whether it's mission work or pastoring, the, the core reality is that the work that our graduates do is, is relational work and somehow it's a hard stretch to believe that it can be done, the training can be done as effectively if we're not face to face. The two elements that are, are typically mentioned in this respect are a learning community and spiritual formation. And wherever you get an objection to online theological distance education, these tend to be where it lies. Sometimes they use words like incarnational or embodied, but, but the basic idea is that in order to be formed spiritually, you have to be part of a learning community, but ideally a worshiping learning community. And so the argument goes, this can only be experienced in effective ways in a face-to-face 
i.e. on-campus modality. And so that becomes the objection. Surely we can't be sure that we are forming people effectively for ministry if they are learning and studying at a distance. But there's a growing body of evidence to show that these doubts are also, if not fully disproven, they're in the process of being disproven. Let me share some of those from you. Ulrich, in, in an article in 2010, that's a long time ago, he made the claim that his online students learned as much, if not more, than their face-to-face -face counterparts. So yeah, we have a teacher functioning in both spaces and, and reflecting on the fact that sometimes his online students seem to experience greater formation than his contact students. That's a radical claim. In a doctoral dissertation in 2011, and Guy Tran um, reports that 79% of the people who participated in his study testified to positive transformation through their online theological studies. And then Alex Skubel um, comments that digital learning can be transformative. Now, what's interesting about him, he, he was somebody who taught for a long time in a face-to-face -face space, and he was kind of forced to take his course on pastoral ministry online. And it, he was kind of forced to do this reluctantly because he didn't think it would work. He thought that somehow the loss of the, the personal contact would compromise the formation element. After doing it for about seven years, this is what he concludes. He said, could making them, referring to the students, uproot, meaning uproot from their local ministry context, to go to school actually lessen the effectiveness of ministry preparation. He doesn't conclude that it does, but he had seen enough after doing this both online and face-to-face -face for seven years to think that sometimes the students who stayed in their ministry context seem to benefit more in terms of their spiritual formation from their interactions in their real world setting than those who left that setting to go into a campus environment. Isn't that amazing? I think that's amazing. One of the major studies done a few years ago was conducted by Miller and Skarin. They published a full report and they published an abbreviated report. And I want to read you a couple of the conclusions that they reach. So this is a major study focusing heavily on the element of whether spiritual formation and ministerial formation happen effectively online. This is what they say in their 2018 summary of their report. In fact, a growing number of educators believe that training for ministry is more, not less, effective if students remain in their own context rather than being uprooted and moved to a residential campus. Their reasoning, the integration between classes and the real world is likely to happen more quickly and more organically if students are living learning and perhaps working in their own faith environment. One dean commented on ATS's dean survey, because students in the online program learn in the ministry setting in which they will serve, we have had virtually no problems with graduates failing in their first congregation. Isn't that an incredible statement? A growing number of those in the know are of the opinion that, it, that the spiritual and ministry formation dimensions of our calling may be more, not less effective, if instead of bringing people to a residential campus seminary, we leave them in their faith community. And on the key question of how people do in their first church that they are pastoring after graduating from seminary, the the ATS representative says, man, we have almost no problems with people failing when they've been serving in that community while doing their theological education. That's powerful. Here's another quote from Miller and Skarin. This is kind of their conclusion on the spiritual formation issue. At this point, the evidence indicates that online education produces outcomes. They have in mind both the intellectual and the spiritual 
growth dimensions produces outcomes at least equal to the level of traditional classroom outcomes. Some would go so far as to say their online students do better overall in a course than those in a traditional class. Clearly, this report shows that we are past the point when the efficacy of online education can be questioned. Take a moment to let that sink in. We are past the point where the effectiveness of online theological distance education, whether we are talking for the intellectual or the spiritual formation components, can be questioned. We passed that point. The, the evidence is conclusive that good online theological education can be as formative and transformative as good classroom education. <clears throat> so what's the conclusion that we draw from that? Well, online theological distance education is effective. It's as effective and in some cases more effective than traditional education for both the intellectual and the spiritual formation components that are so important to us as theological educators. Now, of course, the advantage, insofar as sometimes there's even a better outcome, the advantage doesn't lie in the fact that being separated from the students is better than being with them. Obviously, that's not the point. The advantage lies in the fact that the online student's learning is situated learning. There's this constant integration of theory and practice as they learn in the context in which they live and apply the truths that they're learning. And that dimension is so important that quite often it counterbalances and even overbalances the value of being present with faculty members in the residential setting. Keeping people in their spiritual family and in their ministry context is hugely valuable for theological formation. So on the question of whether it's effective, which is the key question for us, right? The jury's in. It is as effective as contact education, obviously assuming that both are done well. Don't mean it's as effective if it's done haphazardly or half-heartedly. Now, the second point in why we should embrace it is OTDE is not only as effective, it's also more efficient than traditional education. It's more efficient than traditional education. Yes, of course, effectiveness is our primary concern. We want to be putting people into God's mission field that are adequately trained and prepared for effective ministry. But if that is proven to be the case, if it's established that two methods are more or less equal in their effectiveness, that two products are more or less equal in their value, then surely we're going to choose the one that is more cost effective, cost efficient, if you wish, the one that is more convenient, etc. If we think about the training needs of the church globally and, and perhaps most pronounced on the African continent, the training needs are vast. We need models of theological education that can reach as many pastors as cost effectively as possible. And at least at the moment, online theological distance education is the best way to do that. It's simply the most efficient and equally effective way. So I work for an online theological seminary. Yes, I know, I'm biased. Um, <clears throat> but we have about three and a half thousand tertiary students um, from higher certificate all the way up to doctoral level. And we've done some calculations. If we were to run the same size institution, and it would be very difficult to run the same size institution because building those sorts of numbers in, in a residential space is much more difficult than in an online space. Um, but if we were to have a similar number of students working on full-time equivalency, it would cost us in the order of four to five times as much to run the same programs with the same number of graduates, same number of full-time equivalent students. Four to five times as much. Why? Because we would have to invest hugely in property and buildings. We currently have almost no property infrastructure. All of our staff work from home offices around the world. Our students work online. Uh, and so we leverage technology to take the distance out of distance education. We spend on technology instead of spending on 
property and infrastructure. We buy electronic library resources instead of physical ones. Our students can't access them, right? But when you add up all the rands and cents, the economy of scale behind online theological education, just, it just wins. Um, the only reason you would prefer or, or the only reason you would say, no, let's not go online is if it could be shown that there is a meaningful quality difference. But as I've tried to show, the research doesn't bear that up. So in conclusion, now I, I did my first PhD on relevance theory, a communication theory that I applied to Bible translation. And essentially the, the premise of relevance theory is that something is relevant if it produces maximum benefit for minimum effort. That's very much more complex than that, so that's quite reductionistic. But that's the core idea. Something is relevant to the extent that it produces maximum benefit for minimum effort. So the, this interplay between effectiveness and efficiency is how you determine that something is relevant. Well, online theological distance education appears to me, using that criterion, to be the most relevant kind of theological education we can offer the church on the continent in which we live. It's as effective, but more efficient than other modalities that we have available at the moment. And because of those factors, it will become the dominant form of theological education. Yes, it may take longer on our continent as, as technology is arriving slightly more slowly, but that's a matter of time. And yes, something disruptive may happen that changes this trajectory, um, but as things look at the moment, that's where it's heading. And so, friends, as leaders of theological institutions, as those who love theology and want to train God's people for effective service, I think you face a challenging reality that with the, the rise of technology, our institutions will either need to accept that this is coming and adapt, or we are likely, if we deny it, to gradually decline and be less effective. I'll leave it there for today. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about how. So if we believe that this is a direction we need to start moving in, how do we begin to make that transition from teaching in a face-to-face -face mode only to perhaps doing online theological distance education in addition to our normal ways? I'll see you then.